Get ready for a whole new experience at this year's Festival of Homiletics in person and online, May 16 to 20. Join us in Denver, Colorado, or online from wherever you are. This year's theme is After the Storm, Preaching and Trauma, and it will feature Otis Moss III, Nadia Boltz Weber, Anna Carter Florence, and Raphael Warnock. This year, the festival will draw up to 1,200 colleagues in person and thousands more online for preaching, worship, and dialogue to help you develop a hands-on way to engage trauma in your own ministry context. Other speakers will include William Barber II, Lauren Winner, Robert Wright, Yolanda Pierce, and many more. Make plans for this incredible learning experience with top teachers. Join us in Denver or online. Register by February 15 to receive an early bird discount. Go to www.festivalofhomiletics.com for registration and details. Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Rolf Jacobson. And me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Matt Skinner. This is the podcast for January 9th, 2022, the baptism of our Lord. If you use the texts for Epiphany uh, for this, if you transfer those texts in, see a different podcast. But the texts for the baptism of our Lord are Isaiah 43, 1 through 7, Psalm 29, Acts 8, 14 through 17, and Luke 3, 15 through 17, and 21 and 22. So we've got 3, 15 through 17. Again, of course, we had that little section of text back in Advent 3 as a continuation of John's proclamation uh, from the wilderness. And so a a reference, of course, to baptism. And so now here we are at Jesus baptism. And that that contrast between John's baptism and the baptism that Jesus will baptize with Holy Spirit and with fire And, but then here is Jesus himself getting baptized. And one of the things that's always, I think, important when we're doing the baptism of our Lord Sunday is to note the differences between the baptism stories, baptism accounts in each of the gospels. And in the gospel of Luke, it's always so interesting to me that, you know, when Jesus also had been baptized uh, and so there, there's a different kind of chronology here of what's happening and was praying the heavens, the heaven was opened. Uh, and so and that, that addition of praying is unique to Luke and that the, this, the heaven is opened in the midst of this praying, which, uh, which is a kind of astounding, isn't it? It is. It's very Lucan. Very Lucan. Big theme in Luke. So praying for the, the trans- make a note, make a note to that. Make a note of that. Put that in your, you know, put that somewhere. That prayer is a big theme in the gospel of Luke. Uh, but yes, go ahead, Matt. Oh, I was just gonna say that it's it's part of the uh, the transfiguration story as well. He prays all night before he selects the 12 apostles in Luke's gospel. Uh, obviously, the church is engaged in quite a bit of prayer in the book of Acts. So what do you want to do with that? <laughs> it's a great question. One of the things that's fascinating in Luke, though, as well, is the, in those missing verses, John is arrested. So it's Luke, yeah. <laughs> Luke, Luke refrains from saying who baptized Jesus, which is a very interesting. One of the ways in which it tries to, after having woven together these two relatives for the first two chapters, now in chapter three, we want to make sure it's pretty clear that uh, John is John can't uh, John can't hold a candle to Jesus in terms of, of their importance, but still significant, right? This is this is the still the moment, right? This is the what do you, what is it the epiphanic moment, right? Of where the Spirit comes, and now this is going to launch everything in a particular direction. Jesus undergoes a kind of transformation himself. Uh, what that looks like or feels like, we have no idea whatsoever. But now the story is off and running. And so that's, I think, significant as well to talk about how uh, Jesus situates himself in, uh, in a ministry of repentance and forgiveness from the outset. 
and submits himself to that as well as just saying, I'm gonna participate in it. One of the really interesting differences here too in Luke is what follows the baptism in Luke. So in Matthew and Mark, you have the temptation in the, in the wilderness, which for Luke happens after the genealogy. Uh, now, I mean, narratively that is, of course, there is the temptation, uh, you know, the, the, but there's, li there's little interlude, right? Between the baptism and the temptation of Jesus that where we get Jesus genealogy. And, and, and so what is that doing there? I think that's a, maybe another thing that, that could come into a sermon on baptism in Luke. Uh, and what does it mean, mean for Jesus to be baptized, particularly with regard to the claim of Jesus' sonship here. You are my son, not this is my son, which we get in Matthew, but you, as we get in Mark and Luke, the beloved with you, I am well pleased. Uh, and yet, what does that you mean? What does it mean to be God's son? And then you have this, you have, you have then the genealogy taking Jesus, Jesus genealogy back to, uh, back to Adam. Matthew takes Jesus genealogy back to Abraham, John back to, you know, beginning of the world. And, uh, and Mark just, you know, plops you in the desert and hopes for the best. So it is uh, it, it, thinking about that in terms of how, what is this, what is this genealogy doing? And what is it, what does it mean for Jesus to hear or to be that affirmation of what does it mean to be God's son? Uh, I think it's a really important aspect of Luke's, uh, of Luke's baptism. And, uh, and, and, and what, what is being claimed in that sonship? Sonship, what are the connections? What is the, what is the, uh, the uh, inheritance uh, that is being claimed in that sonship and uh, that we are being reminded of here uh, before, before his ministry actually gets started? Because then you have the temptation and then, uh, and then you move into, of course, the, um, the beginning of the Galilean ministry. It's good. What, I mean, what is what difference does it make that he's son of God? I mean, that's of course this is part of the the testing in the wilderness. That mm -hmm. two of the tests, at least I, if I'm ever are going to begin with, if you are the son of God, then do this stuff. Yeah. So the the title alone means nothing, or doesn't. I mean, I should say it doesn't doesn't solve or answer all the questions. It requires now some definition. And so what kind of authority does that hold? What kind of privilege or power does that assign to Jesus? And so he's going to have to redefine that in chapter four. But I think the genealogy that, it, that comes in the intervening verses there is, is significant because it refuses to let us lose the sense of Jesus' connection to the story of ancient Israel told throughout scripture, uh, but also refuses to let us lose his essential link to all of humanity by going back to Adam, that there's a, a way in which he represents not just Israel and Judaism, but he represents uh, the whole human family. And that's, that's got to be part of what the baptism means. It's got to be part of what the presence of the spirit means. And it certainly is part of what the, um, the testing is going to mm -hmm. reveal about him. Yeah, and for the whole human family, for you know yeah. all flesh, uh, chapter three. We, we've already we've already heard this that John the Baptist claiming all flesh shall see the salvation of our Lord, and so this is another way of aff affirming that uh, in Luke. And you know we're going to have a little diversion in John next week, but then we'll be back in Luke, and so to 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 think about that as well that that this is yeah this is another way that that theme the themes that we got in chapter one when we were in advent and chapter two for christmas are coming out here in a different kind of way but that that the all flushness of of jesus ministry and then jesus jesus will say that himself in his sermon but yet in a you know and yet quoting isaiah his mother has already said that of recognizing just for whom has Jesus come, uh, and and who who 
whom will Jesus see and regard and favor? And, uh, and that the, as you said, Matt, the temptation ends up being the way in which the baptism makes a difference in that a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. If we think about repentance as that, is that certain kind of perspective that, uh, that Jesus is taking on that perspective of, of knowing, knowing his identity and it's through that, that knowledge and affirmation of his identity that he has his eyes on, on God's activity and what God is up to and not, it is not detracted from that. You're muted, Matt. I think you muted somehow, Matt. My apologies. I, I think it's a hard Sunday to preach because sometimes people think we have to explain baptism in general or or we have to explain why Jesus was baptized or what it meant to him, um, which the text I think does very little to help us with. But I would think that, that part of it is now is a chance to introduce the spirit so that the spirit isn't something that we wait for Pentecost uh, to talk about. Advent, of course, is infused with talk about the divine spirit. And, and now here, this is part of Jesus' ministry. It will be explicitly so in chapter four when he's in the Nazareth synagogue at risk of, of using Luke as a pretext for Acts, which of course it is, this is an important part of what we're going to see in Acts, that he's, he is possessed by the same spirit that, that I am, that you are, that the people in our churches are, that, that, and that's significant. Um, we'll look at that some as well when we get to 1 Corinthians uh, next week, and then even moving ahead into First Corinthians, this idea of what the Spirit does and, and what it means to share in that same Spirit together. But there's a kind of essential link here that's being forged between us and Jesus, not just because of sharing a ritual. Uh, in fact, I think Christian baptism is different than what's going on here, but because it's, it's the same Spirit. We should say something about that, though. Uh, I got an email last week from a pastor who said that um this pastor said i i couldn't explain the difference between john's baptism and christian baptism so would you help me so um we should just say a couple things about that just uh in case people want a little help with that one is that um there's lots of baptisms in the ancient world it's not just jesus versus John, you know, or Christian baptism versus John's baptism. There's other baptisms. And we don't really fully necessarily know because our best source about John's baptism is our, the gospels, correct? Um, but it apparently John's baptism is a ritual washing, signifying repentance, and then the commitment to live differently, correct? oversimplifying uh yeah i mean luke describes it this way i believe mark uses the same language as a mm -hmm. baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins and so that's not just doesn't necessarily mean like a cleansing although that's probably part of it but a lot of those rituals and you know this of course for all but are are preparatory it's not like a lot of the the reasons you would wash yourself in first century judaism judaism isn't because you've done something wrong or sinful it's because in order to enter into what you're going to do next, whether it's to have a meal or to enter your house or to mm -hmm. come before God in the temple, you need to prepare yourself for what's next. I mean, some of those are uh, as well that have to do with childbirth and sexuality, similar things. It's not like you've done something dirty or gross or bad or that your body has, but in order to be prepared for the next thing. So in many ways, I would see this as preparatory for Jesus. It's a kind of getting himself to the point where he's doing something. Uh, but yeah, with John, there's, it depends which group, right? He does some things that look like what the Dead Sea Scrolls community was doing, but slightly different. And like you said, there's other rituals of, of immersion that have to do with conversion ceremonies in some synagogues. I, I would distinguish this the way in which Acts 19 does when people have submitted to John's baptism, but have not heard about baptism in the name of the Lord Jesus. And so then they're baptized that there's something different there. And the New Testament has many understandings of baptism, but John does not seem to be baptizing people into the death and resurrection of anybody. 
um, think we nor could. is he joining people into a community like we see in Acts. But sorry, Caroline, go ahead. No, no, no. But I, I wanted actually to pick up on that community piece because there is a communal aspect that you could trace. I think when you look at uh, when you look at John or John, sorry, Luke twenty one or Luke three twenty one. Now, when all the people were baptized and when Jesus had also been baptized, there is a sense of, and and, and to know that this is happening in the wilderness. Uh, and, and, and verse 15, as if people were, oh, wait, no, not that, never mind. So, you know, people are coming to, to John. And so there is this kind of, of entering into a, 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 a community or a, a, a reality of community that is larger than yourself. Uh, and it's maybe not the same as how we, how we have adapted Christian baptism to, a membership into the body of Christ or a particular community of believers, uh, whether, you know, a particular church, for example, but there is that kind of communal sense to it because you are, I, I think in part, you are preparing yourself to enter into community uh, in, in some of those early, early manifestations of baptism. But I think the other thing that we all, we are always, you know, going back to your, your question, Rolf, that I think we, we typically are helping people remember is that that and it's a it's, so it's a larger hermeneutic that we've always worked with is how is it that the text sheds light on our our expressions of baptism versus how do we see our own actions of baptism in the text or where do we see justification for it or uh, how is it like out that? That is there some is there some element of this particular version of Jesus' baptism that 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 casts a different perspective on how we experience baptism and what does it mean for us, and that we maybe not get so denominationally entrenched. Yeah. Uh, well, sorry, I thought. No, I that we are not so denominationally entrenched in what baptism means for my denomination, but is, can we, can the baptism of our Lord Sunday actually expand that a little bit um, and not justify how you do baptism, but, but expand what baptism might mean for you, help you to see it in a different kind of way. Not that, not that that's what I would suggest. Yeah, um, all that's helpful. The, in terms of the washing in, uh, in, as a, as a, cleansing or entrance preparation as opposed to repentance uh, it is helpful to remember that in the old testament um being unclean ritually unclean is not the same as being sinful although one needs to be both ritually clean and morally clean therefore washed of sin to enter into the presence of god and the fact that i think it is clear that the evangelists are all bothered by the fact that John's baptism, which was specifically for repentance for sin, that Jesus gets that. And so that, that's one of the things that makes them nervous. But we have to move on. Uh, we've lingered. Uh, we, we have uh, we have tarried long with uh, the first reading. Um, Can we go to Acts just because it keeps up the, the baptism theme? Perf. I know we usually have a pattern. Totes. Let's go to Acts. Rolf said perf, I'm saying totes. Well, this is, you two Fire. are so cool. We are. Fire. Uh, <laughs> well, it's such an interesting story here in, in Acts 8 in Samaria, but in some ways it, it comes up in connection to what you were just saying, Caroline, about mm -hmm. how can baptism of our Lord Sun Sunday uh, make us less concerned about defining what it is for us versus them, but actually make us delight in baptism everywhere. Uh, and I think this is maybe a text that, that could do that because this is a different baptism in the sense that Philip is the one who did it, or at least he's the evangelist who oversees it as opposed to one of the, one of the 12. This isn't in Philip's job description, according to what people thought. And, and Daniel Kirk does a great job of, of laying that out, but it's also Samaritans who are being baptized, which is mm -hmm. one of the delicious aspects, right? Of this, of this text, like why did the, why was the Holy spirit not given? Do you need an apostle there to bless it? And I think I think that uh, Daniel Kirk is right that this is 
This is about a breakthrough opportunity that even though Jesus predicted it back in Acts 1.8 or predicted preaching to the Samaritans, that the reason the apostles come is because they've got to witness this. They've got, not that they have to control it, but they've got to see this is something brand new taking place. And Kirk points out this happens in other places. And those are actually the baptism texts. So in year A, it's the, it's the spirit coming to Cornelius and his household. Uh, the first Gentile convert in Acts, put Gentile in quotes there. Uh, but then Acts 19 in year B, when the disciples of John get rebaptized, or I think better, get baptized now in the name of the Lord Jesus. And now here in your C, you've got earlier story of the Samaritans. It's These are all expansions of the community of faith. Mm -hmm. And I think Acts imagines the baptism ritual, not so much as a dying and rising with Christ as Paul does, but as a uh, a, forms of, a form of inclusion into the community of the saved where salvation is taking place. And um, it's hard to admit that some other people are in there. Yeah. <laughs> there were surely some among the apostles who thought the Samaritans, really? Mm -hmm. um, and certainly when Peter goes back to Jerusalem after baptizing Cornelius, people are like, he had to go into his house and eat? Yeah. Yeah. Really? Yeah, I mean, in that, I think that the... It, it, I guess I, I would connect back to what I was saying before about that. It, we think about baptism as, as a, an entrance right, if you will, often into, a, into a, the community of faith, the body of Christ, and often a particular community uh, that is baptizing you a family of God. But then you step back and you look at what's happening here and, the, and Daniel Kirk's commentary says it so well, baptism is the means by which God's family is demarcated on the earth. And you think of, wow, I haven't just, I'm not just a part of this little community here. Like this connects me to people everywhere. And I'm not sure that we have that perspective of baptism often. And that might be something that, that could really be powerful for people to think about, uh, particularly in this pandemic time of the ways in which we've been connected to the 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 global uh, the our global siblings in ways that we never imagined and and what does that mean and uh and to think of that 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 the inclusion of god uh, god's vision in that i think could be something that would be really powerful for people to hear what does your baptism mean this is what it means it links you to the ends of the earth. <laughs> and, uh, and that's, that's, the, that's one of the promises of baptism for us today. It also links you to that church a couple blocks away that you really don't like. Yes. That you really wish people would stop going to. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh-huh. That's, that's, that's it. So it's that immediate as well as all over. And, um, yeah, it, it makes you think of what does it mean to live, live a baptismal life? Hmm. puts a different spin a baptismal on identity perhaps baptismal identity as we are as many of us are prone to embracing and saying but what does that actually mean i think it lends a different perspective on what that might mean in your life i i, I do like the idea of of thinking of, about how we are linked to the whole world i mean one of the things that if you think about the pandemic has made clear is how incredibly fast viruses can get around the globe. By the time they had identified the Omicron variant in South Africa, it was already here. Mm -hmm. And that just, and then, you know, so that, that of course is kind of a threatening uh, relationship in terms of that is we can, get, somebody in South Africa can, can make us sicker or we can make them sick, you know, uh, if, uh, if a variant develops in you, somebody around the world might, might, uh, get infected by it within a month. Um, but here's a different thing. It's a, it's baptismal identity. It's salvation. It's, it's, uh, the gift of the Holy spirit, all of those things. Uh, it's a really helpful idea, Carolyn. Should we, uh, should we go on to Isaiah? 
Yeah, I mean, I, uh, uh, frankly, we've lingered so long. Just uh, skip the psalm. It's such an odd text. I point you to Jerome, the always reliable Jerome Creech's uh, work. Uh, but Psalm 40, uh, Psalm 43, it, it is really a psalm. Uh, Isaiah 43 is really helpful in a couple ways. Uh, first of all, because it gives, it does give a couple phrases that you could use liturgically in a children's mm -hmm. sermon or in a blessing. The first is, I have called you by name and you are mine, that in baptism, God puts God's name on us and God puts Jesus' name on us and God calls us by name. I, that's powerful. Uh, you can just use that. Kids, you know, kids can learn to do that blessing. And the other is verse four. It's a little more complicated. You are precious in my sight and honored, and I love you. Our, uh, our late colleague, Terry Fretheim, uh, loved to make a big deal out of this is the only place in the Bible where God says, I love you um, in those words. And to hear that is a powerful thing.